Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kate Hudson and I'm chairing this evening's event, marking 20 years since the coup against Hugo Chavez. Hugo Rafael Chavez Frias, president of Venezuela, died on March the 5th, 2013, but his legacy lives on. Today, we are celebrating that legacy, as well as maximizing our solidarity with Venezuela at this vital time. US sanctions against the country have become a full-blown blockade. We are also here today specifically to mark 20 years this month since the Venezuelan people defeated the US-backed coup attempt in Venezuela aimed at illegal regime change. One of the most awe-inspiring displays of people power in history not only defeated the coup, but saw Venezuela embark on a radical process of real social change, sparking discussions regionally and around the world on what socialism means in the 21st century. So why does Hugo Chavez matter so much? And why must we defend his legacy and celebrate the defeat of the coup by the Venezuelan people? Well, firstly, the progressive transformation of Venezuela that he led lifted millions of its citizens out of poverty, standing against social exclusion, marginalization, and institutional repression, thereby restoring to them a long overdue due dignity. And then looking wider, Chavez also played a leading role in the transformation of Latin America into a progressive continent, where in the 21st century, in different ways, many countries have been attempting to build a better world. If the coup had not been defeated in Venezuela in 2002, many of the progressive changes taking place in Latin America today may well not be happening with the strength and unity that they are. And from my own point of view, as a peace activist, he was a formidable voice for peace on the world stage. Before we turn to our speakers, may I first of all convey the apologies of the Venezuelan ambassador. Unfortunately, she can't join us as she isn't well. We send our best wishes for her speedy recovery. And then a quick technical point before we move on to our speakers. One of our speakers this evening will be speaking in Spanish. So if you want to hear the English translation for that, please switch to the English channel on Zoom now in the panel at the bottom of your screen. So moving on now to our speakers without further ado, it's a great pleasure, first of all, to welcome Tarek Ali. He will be well known to most people on this call today. He was a friend of Hugo Chavez. He featured alongside him in the film South of the Border. And he is, of course, author of Pirates of the Caribbean, Axis of Hope, as well as many other vital books for our movement. He is a long-term friend of the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign. So, Tarek, over to you and welcome. Um, thanks, Kate. <clears throat> well, it's uh, 20 years this month since the United States, uh, with the European Union represented by Spain, decided to back a coup attempt, not simply back, but an attempt that they had organized and had been organizing for a whole year. On 11th April 2002, President Hugo Chavez the elected president of the country, uh, constantly referred to by the liberal press, the New York Times uh, and others, including the Guardian sometimes, as a would-be dictator. Uh, uh, that was the constant thing. Yes, we know he's democratically elected, but he wants to be a dictator. Well, uh, this type of Goebbelsian uh, propaganda was broadcast non-stop. Uh, and finally, after a year of plotting and planning, uh, members of the 
some members of the Venezuelan armed forces, generals and uh, senior officers from the Navy finally went to arrest uh, uh, Hugo Chavez and said, came outside and said, we went to see the president and he has offered us his resignation. And from now on, uh, we are, there will be another president uh, and there will be freedom, etc., etc. Well, the first thing that we learned very rapidly, no one believed that Hugo Chavez would have resigned. I mean, none of us listening to it uh, here, the news, uh, believed that. And soon he managed to get out a message via his daughter to the Venezuelan people and to Fidel Castro in Havana saying, I have not resigned. That was the signal for mass mobilizations to begin. And soon it became clear that this coup was not going to succeed. How did it become clear? It became clear because the generals and some other senior officers realized that the soldiers were not prepared to support them. In barracks after barracks, in both Caracas and some cities outside Caracas, soldiers confronted their officers and said, Hugo Chavez, we elected him. Why has he been removed from power? Why? And the um, poor in the shanty towns on the hills surrounding Caracas began to pour down into the city. And they expressed their anger. They looted the rich areas, they burnt cars, they set up barricades, they surrounded the Miraflores Palace. They said that they wanted Hugo Chavez back because he was their elected president. Rarely has a democratic representation played such a big part in mass mobilizations. They knew perfectly well how uh, Chavez had been elected and why he had been elected. And that was something the opposition could never deal with. The New York Times, the day after the coup, actually wrote, with yesterday's resignation of President Hugo Chavez, Venezuelan democracy is no longer threatened by a would-be dictator. Just think on this paragraph. Study it and see what it's trying to say. We have removed an elected president because he was a would-be dictator and democracy will be enhanced now as a result of our coup. That is what uh, uh, they're saying. And then they said the new, uh, the military has handed over power to a respected businessman, Pedro Carmona, who was well known as a fairly corrupt guy uh, throughout Venezuela, including amongst his peers. So scared was he to be measured for the presidential sash in Caracas, where people knew him, that he was flown to Madrid by the Spanish government, taken into a Spanish outfitters, and there they made him a presidential suit and a sash. This all came out afterwards. So that was his confidence in his own tailors, for instance, in, 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 in Caracas. With the mass mobilizations, uh, that were taking place both on the streets, within the barracks. The minute soldiers started joining people marching on the streets of Caracas, the game was up really. Because if you don't have soldiers who carry out your orders and the generals, the bulk of the generals began to realize that this was not uh, uh, going to work out, even though Vice Admiral Victor Ramirez appeared on television, 95, 98% of the Venezuelan television was privately owned uh, by the oligarchs or by uh, conglomerates which served the whole of uh, South America. Um, and uh, they were all prepared and Ramirez came and I quote his words, we have got rid of Chavez, we had a deadly weapon, the media. And the use of the media in Venezuela to topple an elected president was horrendous. 
And most of this was ignored by the so-called democratic media in the West. In fact, for many of you in Britain who are listening to this, the campaign against Chavez, elected president of the country, launched by the private media networks in Venezuela, um, was later repeated on a lesser level, but similar in character and tone against Jeremy Corbyn in 1917 and after to try and get rid of him, even though he had not been elected in 2017. So this whole pattern of regime change worked on by the State Department and uh, uh, the agencies uh, working with it was tried in Venezuela and failed. And one reason it failed was because what the press did not allow its readers, the Western press did not allow its leaders to understand or to think was Chavez's popularity, this constant reference to him as an Idi Amin, you know, that brought in racism as well, because Chavez was not white, or Ubourua, the Le Monde wrote in, 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 uh, in France, vicious, semi-racist campaign, only functioned to topple Chavez and carry out a coup uh, and regime change in Venezuela. So they refused to understand and recognize Chavez's popularity. Why was he popular? As Gate has said, a lot of money was spent on the poor. A million kids were brought into the education system and educated free. Cuban doctors were uh, Cuban doctors arrived from uh, that country and set up medical camps all over the poor areas. Prior to that, in many poor areas, there were no doctors. The poor had to traipse into towns and cities to queue to get an appointment. That ended. So there was a material basis for Chavez's popularity. And the second reason for his popularity, which spread all over the world, actually, not simply in, in South America, was his decision not to bow before the American empire, was to take them on, was to challenge them in public, which he did in amazing fashion at the United Nations, where the, virtually the entire gathering got up and applauded him, including many so-called allies of the United States. And um, he was a pain in the neck as far as the United States were concerned. He was a pain to them because he suggested that there was an alternative to neoliberalism and that this was a form of left social democracy backed by mass movements and with newly elected constituent assemblies to prepare new constitutions. That was the Bolivarian plan. Uh, very democratic, in fact. The, uh, the Bolivarian constitution, one of the most democratic constitutions in the world, which has the right to recall a president, which the opposition who'd attacked that right used it to try and topple Chavez and failed. So that was Chavez's uh, <clears throat> popularity. National sovereignty, continental sovereignty against the American empire and mass support for these measures by the use of democratic means, democratic um, uh, uh, um, movements to allow people to set up their own cooperatives, to talk, to discuss. I mean, I witnessed this myself on numerous trips I made to Venezuela in those years. And in one of my conversations with Hugo Chavez, he said, look, I know we are, you're, we're all more left-wing than we are, but we have to be where we cannot recreate a system of either a one-party state or everything is nationalized. We've seen that does not work and it would be wrong. So democracy is very important to us and the state will intervene economically to improve the lives and conditions of the poor, but we're not going to nationalize everything. That was made very clear right from the beginning. They chose not to believe it, and they chose not to allow any alternative to 
you know, tooth and claw capitalism, that is what uh, neoliberalism is, which punishes the poor. And the reason Chavez came to power, we shouldn't forget, is because of her huge uprising, the Caracaso, uh, which was a protest by workers and others against the, in 98, 99, against the measures imposed on that country by the IMF. So Chavismo, Bolivarianismo, was the response of Venezuela to that, and it sent a wave of hope throughout that continent, and not just there. Chavez suddenly became the global leader with the biggest pull for, for, for people who were not prepared to tolerate the system any longer. He went to India, spoke to peasants in West Bengal, you know, 200,000 peasants turned up to listen to him there. He came to London, spoke at the Camden Town Hall to explain what he was doing in Venezuela, and honestly, it was a very small room. A small hall. We could have packed the Central Hall, Westminster, for that. And it's impossible to understand this this popularity without understanding that he was offering two things: a radical economic program which broke with neoliberalism, a radical foreign policy which publicly defied and challenged the American uh, empire, and national sovereignty for every country in the world that uh, wanted it and not allow this national sovereignty to be crushed by any power. That was the reason for Chavez's is, uh, is, is, is popularity. And I, to, to give you a, an idea of this popularity, I'll just say that when they are coup plotters, the coup lasted two days. It was the briefest coup in the history of the world, by the way. This guy was just a joke, treated as such. The opposition were fighting with each other for who could get the spoils. Uh, they, they weren't able to unite. Later, they attacked the United States for not killing Chavez. They attacked the army generals for uh, uh, botching it up. And they attacked the rival parties for not having done what should have been done. That was the line of this so-called democratic uh, Venezuelan opposition. But <clears throat> I'll end on one story, which is my favorite story from that time. And I heard it a year later after the coup in 2003 when we were celebrating the anniversary because before a crowd of half a million Hugo Chavez told this story to the entire country and it was like this it's very symbolic but very interesting in order to prepare the military band at the Miraflores Palace which plays uh, the national anthem when there are foreign visitors coming or when the uh, president is coming and the flag goes up and the general one of the generals and ramirez went to the band and said we will we are about to bring out the new pr president all the western media is going to be here and the minute we bring out the new president we want you to play the national anthem and a soldier asked in the band asked Excuse me, sir, what new president? The only president we've elected is Hugo Chavez. So who are you going to bring out? So the general said, you will just obey orders. And other soldiers put up their hands and began to ask. Finally, the general's eyes fell on a young 17-year-old peasant lad who played the trumpet with the band. And he said to him, you start by playing the trumpet when I bring President Carmona out. And this young guy said, excuse me, General, why should I play the trumpet for a president that nobody has elected? And the guy got really angry. And suddenly this young trumpeter gave his trumpet to the general and said, you seem to be very keen on playing the trumpet on me playing the trumpet for the new president. Here, I'm giving it to you. You play it when he comes out. Now, that defiance by a 17-year-old soldier of a senior military officer was symbolic of the breakdown of that old ruling class in the sense that they couldn't get away with it. 
And that explains graphically why the coup was such a failure. Of course, they never gave up. And but Chavez's memory, uh, despite the fact that he, he died in 2013, is still very strong. He was, uh, <clears throat> Fidel used to say when he was asked by after Fidel who they would say, and he'd say, it doesn't matter. You know, he says, this is a question which our continent has been answering since Simon Bolivar, after Bolivar, who? So say, is it Sucre? Is it Jose Marti? Who is it? So I'll tell you, he said, now you must add Chavez to the list. After me, Hugo Chavez. After Hugo Chavez, we don't know. And we don't. We still don't know because nobody of that caliber has yet come to power. But the memory of what happened in Venezuela affects election results in Chile, where the candidate of the far right was defeated recently, in Bolivia, where the attempt, successful attempt to topple Evo Morales was finally re reversed by his party winning. And we will see what happens in the Colombian elections, not so far away, where a radical candidate backed for the first time in Colombian history by a black woman, very extremely popular with the Colombian people, who is standing as the vice presidential candidate. The opinion polls are showing that they're going to win, but whether there will be behind the scenes intervention, I don't know. So that is the legacy of Hugo Chavez, and that legacy became magnified after the coup was defeated, because it showed how you defeat coups, not by appealing to other countries to come in, but by mobilizing your own masses. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Tarek. That was fantastically interesting. And I remember very clearly that uh, the event you were talking about when Chavez came to London and he spoke at the Camden Center. I mean, it was just absolutely extraordinary. So before we turn to our next contribution, I just would like to update everyone to say we have uh, hundreds joining us and watching, including from Edinburgh, Cambridge, Kingston, Oxford, Islington, Somerset, Marlow, Antwerp, Manchester, Dundee, Waltham Forest, Hayes, Haringey, Notting Hill, York, Manchester, Sheffield, Brighton, and Athens, plus Indonesia and Melbourne, Australia. So <laughs> thanks to everyone uh, very much indeed for joining us this evening. And I'm going to turn next to Matt Wilgris. He's going to just tell us a little bit about what the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign is up to. And he's also going to read out a message from Chris Hazard MP, who unfortunately can't be with us this evening. So Matt, over to you. Thanks, Kate. And um, thank you, Tariq, for that brilliant um, tour de force. Um, I remember, like, when, when we've, I've been with BSC now for a long time, like since Chavez came in 2006, and I remember that lecture Chavez made in the hall. I also remember a very, not a very memorable event where after Chavez sadly passed away, where Tariq gave a Hugo Chavez memorial lecture in SOAS in the big theatre there, which I forget the name of, I think the Brunel Theatre. And um, a similar thing, we had definitely the biggest attendance we'd ever had at a BSC event, but we actually had to turn people away who were queuing up once so our students in particular had found out that Tariq was speaking and it was about Chavez. And um, it's great to be able to commemorate the defeat of the coup and to see so many left-wing movements doing well in the region today, as Camilla will no doubt comment on. Um, as usual, I'm sort of here to do the quick plugs and I don't want this to be much of that kind of event. So just one thing really, which is thank you everyone for registering. If you can make a small donation to the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, £10 are what you can afford at the moment, please do so on the link provided. It does go directly to paying for things like Zoom, streaming software, web, email list, etc. It doesn't just, doesn't, we do need that to keep going. So please do donate if you can. And as Kate said, I'm just going to read out a quick message from Chris Hazard, who was due to be with us from Sinn Féin, but couldn't in the end. He says, may I please extend my apologies to the VSC for my absence this evening. We are currently fighting a momentous election in the north of Ireland and demands of the campaign have just meant that I'm unable to join you today. At this time, I'm, of course, mindful of the legacy of Hugo Chavez. Chavez taught us that while our individual struggles for emancipation are primarily fought at the local and national level, they are bound to fail if we do not forge bonds of fraternal solidarity and internationalism. 
need to work collectively to strengthen, renew and build international movements against imperialism and capitalism. And Sinn Féin will not be found wanting in this regard. To comrades around the world tuning into tonight's discussion, we appeal to you to look to the North of Ireland in the coming weeks as we seek to secure historic advance. We are entering a time of real change. As Chavez summarised, let the dogs of empire bark. That's their job. Our sister battle to achieve the true liberation of our people. Solidarity now and always. And so thank you to Chris for sending that message through. Uh, thank you to Kate and Tariq and thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, please do donate if you can. Thank you. Thanks very much, Matt. Thank you. Um, so now turning to our next speaker, who is Camilla Escalante. Welcome, Camilla. Camilla is a journalist for Kausachan News based in Bolivia, and she's going to look at the regional impact of Chavez's time in power and how the Venezuelan people's demonstration of strength in 2002 uh, rippled across the continent. So, Camilla, welcome and over to you. Hi there. Um, I'm still muted. Am I still muted? No, no, go ahead. Okay, fabulous. Well, give me a little wave or you can interrupt me if my audio breaks up at all. Um, I'm in Nicaragua uh, this week for a, um, a series of meetings and celebrations um, for the 30th anniversary of Livia Campesina. Livia Campesina is the global peasant movement of 200 million small farmers, indigenous peoples, um, agricultural workers, rural workers um, uh, from all continents. And they're all gathered here today to uh, meet about the upcoming strategies. And so um, it's really interesting here, you know, you would never have such a meeting like this without reference to Hugo Chavez in all of the speeches from the historic leaders. And these are leaders who've been in this movement for agrarian reform, pushing for food yeah. sovereignty and uh, democratic uh, use of land and control of land by, uh, by the people who produce our food and sustain our world. Uh, you know, they are constantly making reference to the Bolivarian revolution. Um, I might go in and out of order a bit, but just one second. Uh, Darwin, Darwin. Estoy, estoy en una llamada, por favor. Um, so um, one of the important things, uh, just connecting it to what's going on here, is that La Via Campesina, again, the largest social movement in the world, has a number of uh, formation schools and um, agricultural worker schools where they bring in uh, students from uh, different countries of largely Latin America to do exchanges and to learn um, about these agricultural sustainable methods. And the lands in which these schools um, were um, built, um, a lot of that was donated by Venezuela. Venezuela paid for um, you know, some of these plots of lands um, in order to build these schools. And one of the Iyala schools, they're called the Iyalas, um, uh, is in Venezuela. Um, I believe in Merida, uh, there's also one here in Nicaragua. And so um, you'll see a lot of uh, Hugo Chavez quotes and, um, and murals and things like that at these, different, at these different schools that bring in young uh, workers that are part of popular movements and, uh, and peasant organizations in their country. Most of the people who benefited from these have not necessarily been Venezuelan. They've actually been from uh, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador and Costa Rica, who've been able to come um, and learn here at the Iala. So I have spoken to and heard from people uh, during this week. And so I wanted to tell you um, some more specific um, ways in which um, Hugo's uh, Chavez's legacy can be felt around the region. In 2009, um, you know, a coup took place in Honduras for uh, you know, numerous reasons. But one of the reasons that we can trace is actually the close relationship between uh, former President Mel Zelaya and Hugo Chavez. Uh, one of the historic leaders of Livia Campesina, uh, Rafael Alegria, he was just here for the celebrations and he was uh, a very you know, close ally of Mel Zelaya and Hugo Chavez. And they were um, among the people, the former President Zelaya, who's of course uh, the husband of Xiomara Castro, the now president, they were pushing for a very strong alliance with Chavez 
at the time of the coup in Honduras. Um, and now uh, this Rafael Alegria, Alegria is actually the vice minister of agrarian reform in Honduras, which is very amazing. This is someone from the popular movement from the basis and who is a student of Hugo Chavez now at a very high level of government. So it's, a, it's an amazing feat for Latin America. Um, so at that time, the military hierarchy in Honduras was against this Venezuela uh, Honduras alliance and you know they warned that there would be consequences and so we know you know at the end what happened there was that the the coup did in fact happen in 2009 unfortunately unlike you know the story that we just heard from Tarek the um what happened in, in Honduras was they consolidated the coup and that it wasn't until this year that they were able to recall reco uh recover democracy in Honduras, and that was a very long period of dictatorship. But uh, some of the programs that they were working on um, installing there or establishing in Honduras uh, were, you know, uh, Petro Caribe and through the Alba Fund. These were uh, set up by Hugo Chavez in the early 2000s, in which Honduras was receiving gas from Venezuela in exchange for food. And the agreement, as I understand, was extremely beneficial for Honduras, they would receive gas and pay 20% in food that was produced by Honduras um, and sent to Venezuela, and 80% would be paid within 20 years. So this was extremely beneficial. And uh, at the same time, Venezuela sent tractors for campesinos to benefit agricultural development and to promote Honduran production, um, which is like absolutely needed in a country that doesn't have uh, food sovereignty um, and has to import so much of the food it uses to, to feed its people. And this would actually help the entire region that these tractors and what was produced would not only benefit the Honduran people and these small farmers, um, but also it would be, um, you know, in turn, some of this food would be sent to Venezuela as well. Um, so these are programs for mutual benefit. We saw some of these same programs um, you know, implemented in countries like Haiti. Obviously they are ongoing in Nicaragua, in Cuba, and in Bolivia, uh, these programs for, for mutual benefit. Uh, we also, um, in terms of the leadership of Latin America, there have, and the Caribbean, there has been a lot of, um, you know, the legacy of Hugo Chavez has been seen through the leaders of the Caribbean nations that we don't talk about as much. But in Dominica and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have two prime ministers who have been around since the time of Hugo Chavez. Both of them are four term presidents, uh, Roosevelt Skerritt of Dominica and Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And they have been around since the beginning of the launching of SELAC, the community of Latin American uh, and Caribbean states. That was an initiative uh, promoted by Hugo Chavez as well as these other integrationist mechanisms or mechanisms for integration of this vision that Hugo Chavez had, um, which included uh, the founding of ALBA TCP, obviously the Bolivarian Alliance, uh, which is currently an alliance of nine countries, five of which are from the Caribbean, four are the, you know, the countries, uh, the main socialist countries in Latin America, which are Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Bolivia. And they also founded uh, the Banco de Alba and uh, Telesur, um, as well as, um, you know, they've been able to initiate a number of medical cooperation um, initiatives with Cuba in order to try to export, um, you know, medical cooperation to every country of Latin America. Um, let's see, um, one of the uh, comrades here from Haiti um, also was reflecting on um, the way in which uh, Petro Caribe up until, um, up until uh, Haiti decided to stop being a part of that uh, was going to benefit not only in terms of providing low, uh, low cost fuel to Haiti, but also um, it would benefit in terms of public infrastructure, schools um, and hospitals and other uh, vital infrastructure for the country. So it wasn't when, when they, you know, took a turn to begin kind of, you know, cooperating more with the U.S. and less than, less with Venezuela in these recent years. It wasn't just a travesty in, uh, in terms of 
you know, that they lost their, their access to this very beneficial deal uh, with fuel, but also all these other public works that they would have been able to, uh, to maintain uh, through this cooperation with ALBA um, and with Venezuela. Um, it's also, like I said, the Bolivarian Revolution in Chavez has had an uh, important uh, influence and it's been a reference for not only the Via Campesina, but uh, the, the mass, the movement towards socialism, of course, I'm based in Bolivia. And um, the radio station that I work at, our outlet, Radio Casachuncoca and Casachu News, um, it's based in the rural area of the Tropico of Cochabamba. And the building that we work out of was donated by Venezuela. Um, it was donated by Hugo Chavez. So had it not been for, you know, Chavez, we wouldn't even have a, a, a headquarters for our outlet. So this is something that you see all across um, all the departments of Bolivia and all of the union halls. You see these murals of Hugo Chavez and plaques because, uh, you know, a lot of the, this process, uh, this revolutionary process in Bolivia was really aided by, you know, its closest ally, um, could be said to be Hugo Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution and the Venezuelan people. Um, and, you know, uh, as, um, as Tariq was saying, he had that profound impact in terms of, um, you know, his radical foreign policy his and, uh, you know, the national sovereignty and economic policy. And, you know, through this and the example of Chavez, many of the people in the popular class, like the people who are gathered here, were able to learn about important issues um, and receive some sort of political formation and context that he provided through his speeches and on Venezuelan state TV. And um, you know, these are these are kind of ideas that have reached all corners of the rural areas of Latin America. Um, anywhere you go, you're going to hear people who might not have obviously a university a university degree. They might not have gone to some elite school, uh, but they were able to hear about the ideas of Chavez. So this has been extremely important. He, relevant today, he spoke on, you know, warned about the threat of NATO expansion, including NATO expansion towards Latin America and in Colombia and the way in which NATO was looking to Colombia to form, uh, to set up bases, obviously the us Colombia military cooperation. He warned of the use of mercenaries. Um, and, you know, the militarism, uh, you know, expanding from the United States to all of Latin America. Um, he warned about, um, you know, the need to be self-sustaining self and how um, national sovereignty is connected to, uh, you know, economic sovereignty, having our own policy, and how in order to be able to strengthen our revolutions um, in a complement complementary way with all the other countries of Latin America and the global south that we would need to first integrate our region, Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as be able to have some south-south cooperation. He spoke greatly of the people of Palestine and said that they are brother people. And he spoke on the issues of military intervention in the Middle East. He spoke about, um, you know, NATO uh, intervention and war overseas. And this is how we learned about so many of these um, you know, so many of these different issues from the very uh, base grassroots of Latin America. Sorry, I've been speaking Spanglish all, Spanish all, all week here. Uh, so, so this is what actually, you know, gave us a bit of a popular education. So I'll end there. There's a little bit of background noise for me here, but thank you so much for, uh, for, for the invitation. Thanks very much, Camilla. That was really brilliant. I mean, I, I had no idea about the vast majority of what you were saying there. So that's that's really incredible education for most of us, I'm sure. So now, thank you very much to our two marvelous speakers. I've got a couple of questions that have come in. I know many of them have already been answered directly, but I've got two that I've put to you both. I'll, I'll bring them out together and then uh, turn to Tarek and then to Camilla. So and if you could give us your thoughts on these, we'd be very grateful. So first of all, what lessons and strength did left movements across the region take from Chavez's political leadership and the defeat of the coup against him? So lessons and strengths. And then secondly, 
To what extent has the rise of methods such as constitutional coups and in particular lawfare, so-called lawfare, been a reaction to the widespread popular rejection of coups like the one in Venezuela in 2002? So quite meaty questions there. Tarek, over to you. Kate, I, I got the first uh, part of the question about uh, what are the lessons, etc. What was the second part? Yeah, it was what lessons and strengths did left movements across the region take from Chavez's political leadership and the defeat of the coup against him? Right. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think the main lesson that was learned is that one way of uh, fighting back is actually by creating democracy on every level, uh, at the grassroots level, which the Bolivarians in Venezuela and the Bolivians tried to do, uh, which the Hondurans are trying to do even as we uh, uh, speak. So the, the importance of grassroots democracy, the creation of radio stations, of even television stations, as was, was attempted in Venezuela uh, and elsewhere, was generally uh, pretty successful. And these experiments, in some cases, had to be closed down because of the appalling situation after the wave of sanctions against Venezuela and then the attempts to topple uh, Maduro. Finally, the announcement, a bit like the announcement of the coup that Pedro Carmona will be your next president. The world was told by the United States and the European Union that Juan Guaido is actually the de facto president because the last elections were rigged and uh, Maduro lost. Now, I'm not going to deny that there have been many weaknesses in the post-Chavez uh, uh, regime in Venezuela, but there are reasons for that. You can't simply say that it's because Maduro isn't as good as Chavez. Some of these problems have developed during the Chavez period itself. So um, because of the, you know, uh, implacable way in which the United States was trying to remove him. But to have the situation which we have now, for instance, of the United States recognizing Guado as the legal president of Venezuela, I mean, it's a joke. How can anyone accept this? How can the Bank of England not release the money which is owed to the Venezuelan government because they say they don't recognize, the British government doesn't recognize the validity of the Venezuelan government today to demand the wealth it has put in the Bank of England. I mean, quite honestly, um, Kate, if this goes on, I mean, any country which has money locked in the Bank of England should withdraw it and find another place because this is taking uh, the sanctions against uh, Venezuela you know, to a sort of a level of absurdity. Uh, but people buy it. They, you know, I mean, I've not seen any press campaign against Guado. On the contrary, the entire Western media backed uh, uh, Guado. There were interviews with him. They now know it's a joke. I mean, I cannot believe that the British, German and French foreign offices take this seriously, but they don't particularly want to annoy the, uh, annoy the United States. Now, as we know, because of Ukraine, there has been a visit to Venezuela of a State Department delegation obviously negotiating on oil and i hope the venezuelans have said well we're prepared to discuss with you which they have uh, but i hope they've also said that the sanctions must be lifted on venezuela because what happens when sanctions hit a country is that those who suffer in any country which has sanctions imposed on it is not the people in power 
but it's the ordinary people. They're the ones who suffer. And the twisted thinking is that by punishing the people, they will rise and overthrow their own governments. That has not happened. And it won't happen because everyone knows who is responsible for the sanctions. In fact, it can have the opposite um, effect of strengthening the governments. Uh, so th the lessons of Chavismo are more and more and more democracy on every level, on the level of the state, on the level of the region, and democracy uh, from below. The Bolivians too went in for this um, in a big way in the early period of after the triumph of Evo uh, and others. And the um, Ecuadorians tried it as well with less success. So these are the lessons to learn that if you have governments which are genuinely popular with the people, it's difficult, you might succeed temporarily as they did in Bolivia, but ultimately, uh, the people come back, they use whatever means they can to come back. And in these cases, they used a form of radical democracy because the other part of the Bolivarian program, new uh, uh, election of constituent assemblies to write a new constitution is now being worked out in Chile where uh, the we will see what they come up with, but it's a good idea. And it's something which is been demanded by the radical left movement in France, by Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who got over 20% of the vote and nearly defeated the uh, semi-fascist far-right leader in the first round. He has come out and saying, we need a new constitution for France because this isn't working and a new con constituent assembly. And we need that here in Britain where we, we are very proud or some people are very proud. We don't have a written constitution, i.e. so the uh, civil service in league with elements of the monarchy and no doubt even more sinister forces uh, can decide to do, operate as they, as they wish, like they did when they created the uh, Cameron Clegg government. Uh, uh, not so long ago. So we too need a constitu elected constituent assembly to sort out all the problems, constitutional problems uh, that exist. It won't be allowed, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't demand it. So these, I think, are some of the important lessons uh, uh, th th that have to be learned. And of course, we know that the United States and parts of Eastern Europe has rigged uh, elections to get rid of governments. I mean, in 2014, they did this in Ukraine, removed the elected, I repeat, elected pro-Russian president and uh, replaced him with uh, the current president who was also elected but they didn't think he would last long i mean this is the irony they thought zelensky uh, would be a short-term president and they'd bring julia timoshenko back but then this business happened this appalling war so zelensky has now become a cult hero for the west even though he was not considered to be uh, someone who is going to rule there for long. So to get rid of all this, we really do need ultra-democratic uh, uh, constitutions and, and movements. And that is an important lesson from Venezuela and the, and the neighboring countries. I mean, the other business which has to be sorted out is the use of money to fund political parties in Brazil, for instance, which can lead to you know corruption on such a high level institutional level that everyone either participates in this or they don't fight in the elections we now have a positive situation in in brazil where the latest opinion polls are showing that uh, lula the popular leader of the uh, pt is on 70 percent no one doubts that he's going to win the next election in Brazil, which will be a huge defeat for the right and the far right. So that is effectively, these are sort of lessons which, you know, different countries learn from each other. Yeah, absolutely. And just to second your 
what you were saying there about Lula. I mean, I know we're all very much hoping that he's going to come back into the leadership of, of Brazil. And that in itself would have an incredible impact, not only on the rest of Latin America, uh, but internationally as well. So let's look forward to that. <laughs> um, Camilla, over to you. Would you like to respond to those questions? Yeah, um, as far as the, the influence that the Bolivarian process revolution and specifically this, uh, you know, two day coup of uh, 2002 had on Latin America, I think a lot of uh, different peoples um, across Latin America, um, both, um, you know, political parties like the MAS but also other peoples from other countries that don't even have leftist governments have been greatly inspired by the civic military union of Venezuela that has been incredibly impactful. And specifically, you know, when the coup was taking place in Bolivia in 2019, uh, and since then, we've not heard people, you know, uh, cease to make reference to the need for this sort of uh, civic military alliance. It was uh, these patriotic soldiers of the Venezuelan uh, army and armed forces, um, along with the people who took to the streets and uh, and made sure that Chavez returned to power in that short amount of time. And this is something that, you know, Evo Morales always knew, and some of the other, uh, you know, ideological leaders of the movement towards socialism knew and had wanted all along. And I think, you know, this is a very difficult uh, issue to bring up in a country like Bolivia, where the far right um, is always attacking the movement towards socialism, they, you know, make it, they, they really have a way of villainizing this idea of a civic military alliance. Obviously, it's a revolutionary idea. It's an idea that, you know, in the past, when we had neoliberal dictatorships, or in Bolivia's case, in the neoliberal period, which is now thankfully over, that you know, the, we can't continue on, we can't continue forward with the same police, the same military as always, we need to refound them. That's what happened here in Nicaragua. After, um, after the neoliberal period in Nicaragua, they had to refound the police and military um, in order, to, in order to, to make sure that they were founded on revolutionary ideals. And so many of the you know, former combatants or the people who participated in fighting on the side of the Sandinistas, uh, were, you know, they, they came back and, you know, demobilized, obviously put their arms down, and then they were asked to be part of this uh, construction of a new revolutionary police and military force that started from scratch and was largely founded by women as well. So this is something that a lot of people have wanted to implement, obviously in Bolivia and in other countries as well. How useful would that have been in the case of Honduras when the coup took place there um, also? Um, you know, another another thing that that we've taken, um, you know, that we've been influenced by is, uh, you know, the way in which uh, there have been now a lot of books written, of course, about the coup um, in 2002 in Venezuela and the way in which the, uh, you know, the, the opposition came and literally shut down the state media. They went into the offices, they took out all of the workers. And they wouldn't allow, you know, um, Chavez's allies, his government, um, to go on to go on air. And they were controlling the narrative. Um, it was complete censorship of anything that was remotely Chavista. They weren't showing, you know, the ways in which the Cuban embassy was being attacked, or you know, the ways in which, uh, you know, the violence was actually being carried out. And so uh, this, a very similar thing, happened in Bolivia. Um, in which they sacked all of the all of the workers of state media for the most part. Uh, they literally just took them out of the office just two and a half years ago, and they brought in you know a new president of uh, Bolivia TV and all these different things. And so this is exactly the reason why Hugo Chavez, one of the brains behind Telesur, um, thought it was so important to have you know, an outlet to compete with CNN and the international media outlets on that international and continental level, uh, to have a sort of um, outlet with those sorts of resources to be able to reach people all over um, our continent in Spanish, and obviously to a, to a lesser extent in, in English, with Telesur English, 
but also, you know, he, he put a lot of emphasis on, you know, the need to, to fight in this, uh, you know, in this information war to be able to combat all of the, the false information in the media um, so that people can, you know, uh, so that, you know, this is when internet is starting and, um, and everything like that. But he knew that this is something that we, that, you know, that was already on its way and we had to, and we had to jump on board um, and everything like that. So I think, you know, that uh, the media thing was really important too. And I think kind of just uh, along with what Tariq said, um, you know, he really showed and people here in the Via Campesina and these, you know, peasant movements will tell you that, you know, the end goal is for these popular movements, these grassroots movements, social organizations to come and take state power. That is the goal, to be able to influence policy, to be able to uh, begin stake, taking state institutions one by one and pushing for a political program and implementing economic policies, socialist economic policies. And that's not something we do as anarchists. This is not an anarchist movement, and that's not the kind of revolution that, uh, that Hugo Chavez led. The idea is to start from the grassroots, but to, as, you know, to be able to convert into national political parties, to be able to take state power and actually implement the programs that are going to help people and their, meet their material needs because, you know, we have been deliberately, uh, you know, uh, deprived from development here in Latin America. That's why we don't have access to very basic resources and technology the way, you know, people do in the global north. So this is what, you know, what we're fighting for is this large project of taking, of taking uh, governments taking state institutions to be able to actually implement those. We don't think that sitting around in a circle on the ground, uh, holding hands, that we're going to be able to make change. To be able to implement that change, we have to come together and really take power as peoples. And so, you know, he really, and the Boulevard Revolution really showed us the path to that. And of course, through that, they were able to, is how they were able to build those 4 million homes uh, that were uh, built under the Bolivarian Revolution, which they just uh, reached in the past month, and all of the various other works that we've seen. Thanks very much indeed, Camilla. That's brilliant. And it's also, if I can say, very nice to hear those birds <laughs> cheeping in the background. It's lovely. It was really nice being outdoors there. Uh, so a big thank you to you, Camilla, a big thank you to Tarek and to everyone for joining us this evening. We've heard from both of you about uh, the powerful impact of Venezuela's political, social and economic achievements, and not just within Venezuela itself, although that's preeminently important, but across the continent too and globally. And I think it really brings home to me, and I'm sure to all of us, how crucial it is now to oppose external intervention in Venezuela. That's, that's the fundamental goal for us. And of course, also how the best way to honor Hugo Chavez's legacy is to build solidarity with Venezuela's social progress and do what we can to support that. And part of that, of course, is to expose and oppose attempts from the anti-democratic right-wing opposition to undermine the democratic will of the people. And they've been stopped before and they will continue to fail, I'm absolutely certain. So finally then, what kind of solidarity can we offer? Well, we can help by joining VSC as an individual. If you're not already an individual member, please do think of joining and also affiliating your trade union branch. I'm sure we have a model motion on the website to assist. And then of course, from your uh, organization, you could host a speaker on Venezuela and I know the VSC would be delighted to help facilitate that. And then also please sign the petition calling for Biden to normalize relations with Venezuela. So those are three key ways in which we can all help to do our bit. And then finally, um, can't let you all go without reiterating Matt's very important point about the finances, the funding for VSC. It does a lot of work 
um, with a small budget. And of course, many, many thanks to everyone who works for and volunteers for VSC. So any support you can give really does make a big difference. And of course, you can do that online. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Please do what you can to support Venezuela and the Bolivarian Revolution. And viva Chavez, viva Venezuela. Thank you. <laughs>